is a place for sharing and a place also for healing. It's a paradise island. Uh, heaven is here. I fall in love with this island because it's beautiful nature. Sand is very white and water is very clean, clear. The people is full of smiling. A lot of Falang, Western people who come live in Kaupangan, open yoga center. On this island, it's very new agey, very international. And a lot of people here come from a place of seeking. And a lot of people that uh, come also come with their traumas and they come here to seek healing. So they are already in a place of vulnerability. Predators, they will look for the vulnerable prey. The brightest lights will always cast the darkest shadows. Believe that. A lot of yoga retreat, yoga school in Kaupangan, many different names, different places. The one is very famous is named Agama. On Kopangan Island in southern Thailand is a destination for your soul, a life changing place to revitalize yourself with yoga, relaxation, and healing. to the focus of philosophy they do have there at Agama. I chose to do my teacher training course there. And so I packed my stuff from Germany and moved here completely to start with a one month course. It seemed to be like very deep and authentic. Straight from the beginning on, you're confronted with deep spiritual and psychological concepts. I was uh, a student at Agama from 2010 and I left in July 2015. At the time I'd left behind my corporate job and a very toxic lifestyle and I was going through a big purification. I found it amazing, I found the yoga really helpful. It's like everything seems normal and then there's the odd thing in every lecture that's twisted in a certain way. There was mention of Tantra, but they were very careful not to go into that too much. The name Tantra originally means this vision of the universe as a holistic universe and the yoga based on energy channels and chakras. But generally today when people use the name Tantra, they use it referring to the sexual part of Tantra, which is like 5 to 10 percent of what Tantra really is. Yes, in Agama Yoga we do teach the sexual part of Tantra. As far as relationships at Agama, sexuality is encouraged. Uh, your sexual exploration is uh, encouraged. Multiple partners are encouraged. Uh, experiencing polyamory is encouraged. And it was well known that Swami had many lovers. When you have a healthy animal, that healthy animal wants to sleep, to eat, to have sex. The Hatha Yogis are persons with strong sexual energy and with strong sexual impulses. I just remember getting to a point where I was like, I don't want to leave. So I started working in reception. A month or two after that, my boss quit and I, I took over her role. So I stepped into my first manager's meeting. We were told there were, there were trouble with girls, but we didn't, it, we didn't know what it was. And not knowing that there'd just been some scandal had erupted with Narciss, being predatory with students. I have a 
friend and she did the TTC and during one of her mandatory meetings with you as part of the TTC, you and she had sex. Uh, this is according to her. And and then she was she was feeling very regretful. It may have been years ago. This thing is happening less and less because I'm getting older and older. Right. right? If, if, if you would have come here 10 years ago, or if you would have known me 20 years ago, yeah. you would have seen that it happened all the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Simply because I was a young stud yeah. and I could do these things. Yeah. It's again a matter of values. Yeah? If I see that somebody would benefit from tantric sex, mm. I'm a teacher of tantric sex, yeah. and it's exactly like I would be a martial artist and you would want to learn Kung Fu from me. Yeah, yeah. Should I give you a book of Kung Fu? Don't I show you? Like I'm telling you, stand up, yeah, take yeah. off your shirt, and let's, let me show you a few moves. Yeah. Tantra, it's the same. He's so charismatic. I mean, this has been his life for 30 years, so everything that he talks about, he transmits with like so much confidence that it's kind of, it's kind of attractive. Charisma is often misunderstood by people. It's actually a social relationship. It's not a particular characteristic that a person has. So the person who is believed to be charismatic has power over the people who believe that. In general, it's money, sex, or power that motivate these types of leaders. Uh, sometimes it's just one of those, sometimes it's all three. I exactly knew, okay, I'm going there for the philosophy and that's it. And I was prepared that there's a lot of sexuality happening, but it's not what I am there for. So it was constantly in my little no bubble. I have very strong depression, very strong mania. So I'm really desperate to change something on that. And you practice and practice and nothing changes. You continue to be a slave of your own fucking brain chemistry. The only thing you hear from everywhere around is just like, yeah, try tantric sex. And you see many people, they're like living for years and they're very happy and absolutely self-empowered and their confidence. And so you're like, okay, maybe this is helpful. And so I... I started to take on the idea to receive a yoni massage from him. Yeah. Yoni massage is an internal and external pelvic floor massage. But the yoni massage uh, with Swami was like, there was no checking in to create a safe space. There was no emotional check-in with the woman. It was just like, okay, get off your clothes. Here's the bed and here are my fingers inside of your yoni. and like. Yeah, and then he even asks you if he can use his lingam. He asks several times. It was really an uncomfortable thought in that moment, and so I refused to do this. But um, I didn't stop the process, which most of the women do not stop a process once it's running. You have this deep feeling of shame and guilt. And so you kind of like, okay, eyes closed, go through. The most of people that come to Agama, they have uh, trouble in their life. So they come in and they want to find healing. When somebody told you that uh, he can heal you with his sex, so how you be sure that it's going to help you or is for his own desire? Right now, for example, what's happening, even before you, there were two women were here. Both of them, I advised them, seek yourself a partner. Right. I like both of them. I could have done it with both of them. Mm -hmm. I'm not. As I'm getting older, yeah. I'm calming down, you know, but normally I would have volunteered. And yeah. I said, what, you are staying and you, your, your cervix is hurting. When, yeah. you're, when you are penetrated deep, you have cervical pain. Yeah. I can solve that in five meetings, probably from the first, you know. I can so like I can open your yoni like a flower, you know, and so on. And I know that I can do it. Yeah. And it's so difficult to restrain when you know I could make this woman happy in one week. In sexual healing, the number one question is who's it for? If you are doing a sexual healing act for any purpose other than for the benefit of the client that has come to you trusting you with their body, then you're completely out of integrity. 
if you're using your lingam, your wand, as a healing tool, you need to be really advanced in your ability to maintain the healing intent. You know, how, how do you maintain your arousal while being completely doing this for another person? That's a very tricky place to, to be in and a slippery slope. So what actually broke me down in the end was I went to Bangkok and I had a, a routine pap smear and it came back with the results that I had abnormalities and so I went to the school's doctors both recommended that I should have sex with a, a tantric man and that would clear the energy on my cervix and that would heal me. Because of this, this health issue I ended up asking Swami and he said well I'll give you a list of men that you can approach and he gave me a list of five senior teachers and um, none of them were available kept pestering me, how are you getting on with that list? How are you getting on with that list? Without being explicit, Swami was basically saying he was available um, if I wanted his help. And um, as time went on and he kept chipping away and I remember going up to him at the end of a lecture and just saying, oh, I think I need your help. And I really believed that this was going to heal me. I was with him a few times in 2013 and then again maybe two or three times in 2014 as I remember it. There was nothing tantric about it, it was very rough and ready, it was very all on his terms. So even though it was supposedly consensual and I'd gone to him, looking back, you know, the, the power differential. It doesn't feel consensual at all. Um, but then there was the incident which I reported to the police in, where I was in bed with him and he just basically threw me over, flipped me over and just rammed his cock in my ass with no warm up, no, no consent, no, yeah, it, it was brutal, it was painful. And I said no and he just kept going and it was, it was horrible and I just had to kind of lie there and afterwards he just pulled himself off and he actually said oh sorry about that so he knew he'd done wrong but it was it was horrible he assaulted me i guess looking like at the time i didn't want to frame it like that then i heard from a few other people that they were also having these really like unsettling experiences with him isn't it interesting how it's often by virtue of other people's suffering more than our own that we're able to take action? While I was at Agama Yoga, I personally experienced sexual coercion, sexual manipulation, and harassment by the head Swami there. These women who spoke out and put their stories on record finally gave me the courage to share my story. This sort of thing thrives in isolation. I thought, well, maybe I was one of the only ones. Maybe I was one of the only ones who didn't want it and that's why it was so bad for me. It's the collective sharing, it's the courage and the willingness to speak out that creates the safety, that creates the ability to say, oh my God, me too. There was never any any discussion of boundaries or consent or anything like that. Um, and in, in the Tantra courses, um, it was like, yeah, you can skip out of any exercise if you want to, but that, that means you're blocked. If you're not feeling things, well, you're blocked. Your chakras are blocked. You know, so a lot of people just overrode their intuition and pushed through their boundaries because they wanted to work on themselves. Peer pressure is one of the most important things in these communities. Why am I being told to have sex with that person? And you think, hmm, this seems kind of odd, but no one else is saying anything about it. And in fact, your peers are encouraging you to go along with it because this is your path to enlightenment. You're gonna think there's something wrong with you, right? You don't believe enough, you don't care enough, you don't trust the leader enough, right? And that's why these closed communities are so 
powerful, sometimes the peer pressure is underrated. Everything is put on the power of the leader, but in fact, it's a group dynamic. Once the articles came out, he basically just fled like a, like a coward. With the Thai legal situation, a report of rape needs to be reported within three months of the incident or it's void. And for those of us who did report, ours were years after the effect anyway. You know, I've only been watching from afar, so I'm just getting reports from the inside. So I know the school is open again, and I think there was a bit of a whitewash within the school of, oh, let's try and change, let's try and look at these issues and do an internal investigation. And I know there was some lip service that was going on with that. The, the $50 million question is, has there been true learning through deep self-reflection and self-evaluation? Or is it lipstick on a corpse? You know, is it, uh, is it just masking, trying to gain public faith and trust again, only to be led into more of the same? So we will see, you know, the, the time, time will tell. Obviously, I haven't met the so-called Swami, but it was said that he would tell his female followers that they should have sexual, several sexual partners a week, that they should have sex with him in order to achieve spiritual healing and spiritual enlightenment. Something can be identified as a sex cult when that is the main way that people are exploited and abused. Sure, they do yoga, but the real purpose is to satisfy the sexual needs of the Swami. I don't know where it goes from here, I really don't. I'm hoping that it just kind of fizzles out because of its grossness and lack of integrity and that people go down with the sinking ship. I think there's a lot of people who've left that we all need to do some deep inner work on ourselves and ask ourselves some very difficult questions as to how we ended up there and what lessons we take from this. I've turned it into something that has radically shifted my need to subscribe to large group orientated teachings from somebody else who's studied for a long time like i don't have the same like almost naive surrender that anybody has an answer for me like all the answers are in here <laughs>